Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to our first class in our Introduction to Biblical Studies course. Today we are in downtown Miami, and it's appropriate because it's the beginning of the fall semester, which means the weather here in downtown Miami is temperamental. We have lots of thunderstorms, and it's the middle of hurricane season, and that can determine our plans for any outdoor events or even having class at all. In the same way, the Holy Land was dependent on weather. The Bible is written and took place, all the events recorded in the Bible took place in a real place, in real history. And so the purpose of our first class is to explore the times and places that are encompassed in the biblical text. And so as we turn to our agenda, we're going to spend a good bit of our time looking at biblical geography, the world of the Bible. Then we'll say a few things about the broad history of the Old and New Testaments, and then we'll talk about archaeology, which is a tool, a complementary tool that can help us understand the world of the Bible. But we begin with geography. The Bible is set in principally three main places. Starting from the east, we have Mesopotamia, which is the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, modern-day Iraq. Then we have Syro-Palestine, which includes the Holy Land, but also includes the countries of Lebanon and Syria today. And then we have Egypt. In reality, there's a fourth place for the Acts of the Apostles, as well as the Book of Revelation and some of Paul's letters, Asia Minor and Southeastern Europe, but we'll leave that for another time. These three areas, Mesopotamia, Syro-Palestine, and Egypt, form the backdrop for the entire Old Testament as well as most of the New Testament. And what's most important for our perspective today is where they get their water from. Mesopotamia gets its water from snow melt from the areas to the north of Mesopotamia that flows into the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And so the societies of Akkad and Sumer and then later Assyria and Babylon, these two great empires that were constantly terrorizing the people of God, they were able to get irrigation from those rivers so that they could water their fields and grow food. Egypt also got its water from a river, the Nile River. Unlike Egypt and Mesopotamia, which were two civilizations that were able to find stability because of the water they got from their rivers, and thus they were able to eat reliably, Syro-Palestine, including Israel, was dependent upon rainfall. And rain, just as it is today in our climates here in the West, is unpredictable. You can see on this chart, this is the average rainfall over several decades of time in modern Israel. Rainfall varied from year to year. And so the people of Israel, the people more broadly of Syro-Palestine, were dependent upon rainfall that didn't just occur in abundance, but also occurred at the right time of year so that they could grow their crops. When rain didn't come at the appropriate times, and thus bad harvests resulted, famine was the next consequence. That explains the backdrop for why Abram is fleeing to Egypt because of a famine in the land. Moreover, in the Old Testament, after Moses leads the chosen people out of Egypt and out of slavery, one of the blessings God promises to them is that they will receive rainfall at the right times of year. Indeed, you look here at Deuteronomy chapter 11, God promises seasonal rain to the land of Israel right before the people enter into the promised land. Notice it even mentions the early rain and the late rain. This is promising them a stable harvest. And so you can see, for the narrative books of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, especially the Gospel of John, the availability and reliability of water, and thus the food that water made possible, forms much of the plot line, much of the backdrop for what the inspired authors are telling us. As we zoom our camera lens in and look more specifically at what would be the land of Israel, you can see on your screen here, this is a view of the map. This is set during New Testament times, during Jesus's public ministry, where he's going between the northern part of the land. So you can see where Bethany, the northern Bethany, that's just south of the Sea of Galilee on your map, as well as where Nazareth is, that's the land of Galilee. Then Jesus would eventually go to the south where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are, that's the land of Judea. In between the two, where Shechem is, this land that Jesus 
usually avoided, that's the land of Samaria. As we look at Israel proper, there are four main longitudinal zones. And by longitudinal, we mean these narrow slivers that go north to south as you look at your map. Starting from the west, closest to the Mediterranean Sea, we have the coastal plain. This was the area that was very important for transportation. Indeed, as you look at your map, you can see all those little brown lines, those are roads. So these were important for commerce, and they're alluded to in the biblical text. But Israel usually didn't control that land. Indeed, the southernmost part of the coastal plain was the land of Philistia, where the Philistines came from. They were usually at war with Israel, especially in the books of Judges and Samuel. And then further to the north, you had the Phoenicians, uh, especially the people of Tyre and Sidon. So as we move to the east from the coastal plain, the next major section is the hill country. We have both the hill country of Galilee, which is where Nazareth is, as well as the hill country of Judea, which is where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are. That forms the backdrop for the stories of the Annunciation and the Visitation in Luke's Gospel. It also forms the backdrop for this account in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus is in the area around the Sea of Galilee, but he withdraws to the northwest to the region of Tyre and Sidon and he heals this Canaanite woman. Mark's Gospel will call her the Syrophoenician woman. But Jesus goes to a foreign land where he performs an unexpected miracle. Moreover, as we continue to the west, we had the coastal plain, the hill country. Now we have the Rift Valley. This is where there is a precipitous drop in elevation. The Jordan River is below sea level, and the Jordan River flows from the Sea of Galilee, which is also below sea level, south to the Dead Sea, which is the lowest place on planet Earth. And then as we get to the Far East, that's the Transjordan, the land across the Jordan River. It starts low-lying, but then as it picks up an elevation and moves further to the east, it becomes desert and thus uninhabitable because if you can't eat, you can't live there. So that's a lot of geography in a nutshell. I wanna say a few things now about the history, the broad history of the Bible. You'll notice on your screen here, these are the main eras that the Old Testament intersects with. You can see we don't have anything that really details the Stone Age. Some of the earliest parts of the Bible detail the world of the early Bronze Age, but we start to hear more during the patriarchal narratives, which make up the last three quarters of the book of Genesis. Those are set in the Middle Bronze Age. Then the book of Exodus is set when Egypt is the main hegemon in the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent is the sum of Mesopotamia, Syro-Palestine, and Egypt. Then we have the Iron Age, which begins around 1200 BC. That's when the book of Judges is set, and this is when most of the biblical Old Testament narrative begins. We have Judges, the United Monarchy, Divided Monarchy, and then these other eras are occurring in the Iron Age. In 586 BC, the Babylonian Empire exiles the Southern Kingdom. You'll remember that after the death of Solomon, the people of Israel split into a Northern Kingdom and a Southern Kingdom. Assyria had exiled the Northern Kingdom in 722 BC. In 586 BC, the Southern Kingdom is exiled by Babylon and the first temple is destroyed. The Persian Empire, when it conquers the Babylonians, will eventually allow them to return under King Cyrus the Great. Later in the sixth century, around the year 515 BC, Israel will dedicate its second temple, beginning what we call the second temple period of Judaism, which goes from 515 BC through the Persian era, the Hellenistic era when Greece controlled the land, and then into the New Testament period when the Romans controlled the Holy Land. The second temple period comes to an end in AD 70, which is a few decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's destroyed during the first Jewish revolt when zealots and other Jews rebelled against Roman authority. I want to conclude today by talking a little bit about archaeology. Sometimes people get the wrong idea with biblical archaeology. They see it as in competition with the biblical narrative. They see it as a challenge to biblical history. That is not accurate, I would submit. Indeed, both biblical texts and archaeological remains require exegesis. They require interpretation. They don't explain themselves. They require analysis. But you can see here that they complement each other. Of course, the biblical texts are inspired by the Holy Spirit and are composed by intelligent human authors. 
but they also portray what the author wants to show. As we'll see as we look at the different biblical books, each biblical author has a purpose. Each inspired human author wants to tell his audience something. There's a reason that that inspired human author picked up his pen to write. And they've been preserved intentionally in the canon. Archaeological remains, more or less, are preserved randomly. So they provide a different perspective. As we go forward in the course, we're going to have an opportunity to look at how the church has come to understand the Bible over time. In our next class, we're going to look at the patristic period and see how the church's early church fathers interpreted the Bible. Until next time, read well and pray well.